everybody. I told you I had something special lined up for the end of Lotus Week, and I hope you'll agree that this is very, very special. This is a 1961 Lotus Elite Type 14 Super 95. Early Lotus record keeping is not the most accurate and is uh, prone to the odd bit of fudgery. But this is believed to be one of about 12 to 16 cars ever made. The Super 95 bit of this car's title means that it has 95 horsepower, which doesn't sound like an awful lot. But then when you consider that it has a curb weight of some 500 kilos, yes, this car is lighter, I think, than any k I've ever driven. That's pretty remarkable. Everything in here feels utterly and completely devoid of any inertia or any solidity whatsoever. To look at, the Type 14 is very much a baby E-Type. And when you see it in the flesh, that is the impression you get. I think the lines actually work better than in even that famous and well-regarded Jaguar. It's warm, really warm. As you might expect, air conditioning not really high on Colin Chapman's priority list when this car was made. It's been very kindly lent to me by its owner, Paul, who also had the Lotus Cortina that you may have seen me driving earlier in the week. I can tell you this is a completely different driving experience. All of the controls do feel somewhat more connected, despite the fact that this is a much earlier car. It has rack and pinion steering. The brakes, quite nice too. Throttle pedal, nice and direct. This car's running SUs rather than Webers for its carburation. And it's just the cutest little thing. It really is. This gear lever here feels like a pencil jabbed into the center console. And I'm rather convinced with every gear change that I'm just about to break the entire thing off. I have been warned about this car. You see, the elites are notoriously fragile. People often use the term race car for the road, but with this car, they really were not joking. It literally is a racing car with number plates on it. They're famed for having the most ridiculous maintenance schedules. You need to re-grease all of the bushings and bearings every few thousand miles. If you get it wet, there's no seals to keep the water out of everything. So the minute you get it home, you've got to regrease it, otherwise it will all seize solid. It has a fiberglass monocoque to which they directly attached parts of the suspension. And many people found out, much like a Cayman GT4, the fiberglass isn't the strongest of all materials. If I crash this car, I will die with lots of fiberglass in me and a wooden steering wheel. So I'm going to take attention, I'm going to be careful, I'm going to get to learn this car, but I am still going to have a lot of fun. And you know what? This car is a dream. The Cortina was a real pleasant surprise, actually. It wasn't daunting whatsoever, but this car feels just that much more purposeful. I am sweating quite a bit, A, because I'm nervous, B, because it's over 30 degrees out there, and I wish that this car had a leather wrapped steering wheel rather than the wood that it does. I know there'll be one particular Scottish individual that will spring to mind whenever anybody sees a car like this. And I can only imagine how exciting it must have been having one of these being a real playboy in the 60s and you would have been something of a playboy if you could have afforded one and the upkeep. These are a lot more expensive than an E-Type and a lot less luxurious. Having a motorbike license I'm told also is vital experience being able to drive one of these because if you go over any sort of serious imperfection in the road something will break. No pressure then. Of course it doesn't have the most poke load down, but it's certainly tractable enough and getting it off the line is pretty easy. The pedals are fairly close together, but I was prepared for that. But it's one thing pottering this car around. Let's work that 4-speed ZF gearbox and upgrade and see what she's like, shall we? Those 
95 horses are provided courtesy of a 1.2 litre Coventry Climax engine. And if you've never heard of that, it's got the most fascinating history. Started life as a fire pump and became a Formula One engine. Sounds magnificent. Oh yeah, you. every single movement you make is amplified through the car, even just lifting off produces an effect quite a dramatic one as well feel that everything as the weight transfers back to the front the whole car unsettles then settles and it makes a really distinctive noise as well not like anything else i've ever heard oh, it's so well damped so Lotus-like, one might say. And this is the perfect kind of road for it. I'm doing no speed at all. The, the speeder happens to be broken, so I'm doing 20 apparently. And in fact, I may well be doing 20, I don't care. Feels brilliant. Gearbox is horrid though. I feel like I'm just gonna rip the entire thing out every time I go for a change. And no, shouldn't have changed up there. Come on, old girl. Yes, you can do it. You can do it. Imagine these harnesses, not standard fit. There were no seatbelts at all in this car originally. Not sure they make much of a difference because they're bolted to fiberglass. Nothing else you get bolt to, even if you put a harness bar in, that'll be bolted to fiberglass. Oh, and it bobs and it ducks. It really moves and you gotta keep an eye on that road. Oh yeah, the thing settles and you get into a rhythm with it. Even more so than with the Cortina, I'd say. The Cortina, you have some control over. But this, you've just got to let it do its thing, let it dance. I feel like I'm riding on the back of Oliver Reed down this road. It's just... All the time. <laughs> oh. So, brakes not as good as the Cortina. Thanks for pulling out on me, you Peugeot. Maniac. like that like I'm getting rice I need a chopstick to change gear it's so delicate it's amazing I, I thought it was gonna be really quite firm you know because it is a proper old race car but it's not you understand how they adopt such ludicrous angles of attack when you see them in period there's some really quirky funny stuff as well like the indicator you turn a little lever and apparently it's essentially deflating or inflating a, a squash baller he said that is then essentially a timer. So you've got 10 seconds of indicate and then it'll turn itself off. Actually also, a lot more refined in here than I thought it would be. This is amazing. Just so sweet, so light. And I, I feel like I'm barely turning the steering wheel here. You very much drive it on the throttle and on the brake. Just tell it which way. Do you want left or do you want right? The rest of it, all done with the pedal box. I drove recently, you may or may not have seen the review, an Aston Martin DB6, and this is as different to that as you imagine it could be. Both of them ride in a very similar, typically 60s way, with this real floatiness running through them. And actually what really surprises me is that the Lotus doesn't feel like the less premium product. Sure, the Aston does feel a, a bit more upmarket, but it doesn't actually feel cheap in here. Only really the slightly nasty roof that gives it away but it is proper the old zf logo here on the gearbox just went to look for the uh, side mirrors there aren't any probably wouldn't do anything anyway they I mean you can really pick your line with this car as well well actually i'm driving here at well Apparently 90 mile an hour. I quite assure you, I'm not. No buffeting in here. I'm still warm. Very warm, much warmer than the Cortina. However, it works well, it's not disturbing. And I'm enjoying it. That gearbox is definitely the, the worst bit for me. There's an imprecision to it, so there's always that little moment of worry when I when I let the clutch back up. 
the whole diff is all solidly bolted to the car and unlike the Cortina this has discs all round at the rear they're inboard which was sort of quite a fancy thing I think at the time oh yeah look at this those brakes do work when you lean on them by, by early 60s standards anyway I mean you know we gotta give our owners need not be concerned dance with it, you dance with it, you move, bit of throttle, you don't really upset the car, the front ducks and dives, you feel that rear just, just slides along a little bit, go on, cross plies, these must have been a right handful. I did do quite a bit of research ahead of driving this car, but there's very little of it that I want to tell you, because if you want to know more about the story of this car, then go and check it out online. And if you want to know the story of a very interesting elite, there's a book by a friend of mine, Michael Hipperson, called Chasing Elites. And it's a story of one man, a Mr. Mosley of London, who you may have heard of before, and the quest to reunite him with the uh, Lotus Elite Type 14 that he had as a young gentleman. I, in fact, did a video on that very car. Doesn't help. And now there's a book about it, and all the proceeds go to a, a very worthy charity. So. I may put a link to that in the description below as well. If I haven't, someone remind me. I do apologize to anybody hoping that the videos on Lotus stuff this week were gonna be some sort of technical featurette. But the fact is that if you wanna know the specifics of them, there's many better people to ask than me. But there are so few examples, so few videos of these things actually being used. It seemed a crying shame not simply to just get in it and enjoy it. Lotus Elite Type 14 Super 95. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already. See you all for the next one. Bye bye.